Let's go. And hello, everyone, and welcome for this third talk of our series on open source tools for neurosciences. This talk are part of the Open Neuroscience Initiative, which is basically um, a central repository for open source projects related to neurosciences. So if you have a project and you would like to list it there, or if you would like to contribute with us, you can directly contact us on the website, which is open-neuroscience.com, or you can also find us on Twitter. Um, just to remind you, we're also part of the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. It's a COVID-inspired platform where fellow neuroscientists daily host similar talk, but in their respective fields. So as usual, you'll find all relevant links in the description below. Today, today I'm very glad to receive my friend and colleague, Philippe Hagnac. So Philippe obtained his PhD in physics at Wroclaw University of Technology in Poland. He then moved to Trondheim, where he got a postdoctoral position at the Norwegian University of Science and Technologies. And is now with us in Brighton at the University of Sussex, where he integrated Tom Baden's lab. And there, over the years, he has improved multiphoton microscope systems. And today is going to tell us about one of these systems that he implemented here, uh, which he entitled non telecentric two photon microscopy for 3D random access mesoscale imaging. So I guess Philip will explain to us what all this term means and how is that related to open source and how we can all use it. Hello, Philip. Thanks for being with us today. Um, hello, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you, Maxime, for this uh, uh, for this great introduction. It's a very great pleasure for me to, to be here today. And uh, yes, today I want to show you uh, my project relating with uh, uh, with upgrading of the of the two photon scanning microscopy for uh, mesoscale uh, imaging. The two photon absorption effect uh, has been first time described uh, in 1930 in a PhD thesis of uh, Maria Gopromeyer, who got the Nobel Prize in Physics for the dis discovery in 1963. Uh, the two photon absorption is a simultaneous absorption of a two photon with energy lower than the excitation energy of the, of the molecule. Uh, so when we obtain some sort of the threshold or the concentration of photons in a, in a specific area, we can obtain the, the, the uh, absorption, so also the emission from only the tiny, tiny uh, specific region, uh, in this case is the, the excitation spot or the, or the point, point spec function. Uh, typically the two photon absorption uh, is occurred by uh, by using of the femtosecond lasers, pulse lasers, uh, with the wavelength of, uh, of, of double of the expected uh, emission uh, wavelength. So to get the, 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 the typical green emission, we need to use uh, uh, femtosecond laser, which emits uh, around uh, uh, one, uh, one micrometers. Uh, two photon scanning microscopy is widely used in the field of uh, neuroscience uh, since the mid of the uh, of the 90s. Uh, so uh, in this cases, this tiny, tiny uh, focused uh, spot, uh, which excite only the specific area and nothing above or, or below, uh, is moved across the, the, the sample uh, by the scanning mirrors. Uh, and uh, thanks to that, we can simultaneously observe the activity of, uh, of multiple uh, um, multiple neurons in the, in the, one, uh, in the one frame. Uh, Standard two photon scanning microscopy setup is built by the some sort of the femtosecond uh, light sources, very, very often tunable. Uh, after that, uh, power control unit, typically the Pocal cell, beam expander, scanning mirrors, so the uh, galvanometric or the, or the resonant mirrors, scan lens, tube lens, objective. Below there is a sample, and there is also the independent collection, uh, collection path with the photo multitube. <clears throat> of course, from the time when the uh, two-photon scanning microscopy uh, has been applied for the neuroscience, people are working to uh, to, to improve those uh, those methods to just simply make it make it better. And what are the the main problems and the main limitations are the trying to make some sort of the uh, compromise between the speed of the of the scanning and efficient signal to noise ratio. Because if we are trying to scan faster, we are just simply uh, losing the amount of the signal which you are collecting in the in the same time. We also would like to have a possibility to 
to, to, to image uh, in the volumetric manner. So it's meant to collect the data not only from one depth, but from, uh, from, the, from the different depth uh, in the relatively short time without many help movement of, uh, of an objective. Of course, uh, we would like to have a big field of view, which is typically limited uh, for, the, for the standard 20x objective up to uh, half versus half millimeter, and even lower for the objective with the, with the bigger magnification. And of course, as in the biology, nothing is uh, flat, nothing is square. We would like to have a, a possibility to track our region of interest, our samples, uh, uh, our structure according to its shape. So do not lose our scanning time for the places uh, uh, when we don't expect any, any activity. Uh, what is also very important is to adjust our experimental approach according to the kind of sample on which one we would, we would like to do. <coughs> I'm sorry, our experiment. Uh, just look at the uh, parameters uh, of, of the different species, uh, the size of the brain, the density of neurons, and average size of neurons, which is absolutely different uh, from Drosophila, zebrafish, or the, or the mouse or rat. And so using exactly the same setup for all of those kinds of, uh, of experiments on, on this species uh, is uh, just inefficient. Uh, why it is inefficient? This is an example. So if you are trying to do experiment on, on, uh, on mice and our spot is very, very, very tiny, uh, much smaller than the size of the, of the cells and we would like to just collect the signal from the, from the cell bodies, uh, if we scan across the, the frame with, the, with, with this tiny, tiny spot, we are collecting only the signals from the cells which we are crossing by. But when we just simply increase the size of the excitation spot in Z, just collecting the same frame, we can get the signal from much more cells in the same time. So by adjusting it, we can just simply get the much more information during the same experiment. <coughs> in the other hand, for example, on the zebrafish, when the cells are much smaller and uh, much denser located in the, in the structure in the brain, uh, we also need to adjust our size of the spot because from the, some of the area, we can get the problem with the cross-talking, uh, cross-section of the, of the cells in the same XY direction. So in the same XY region, we can collect the signal from two different cells, which is uh, something that we don't want to do. But when we move to the other region of the, of the same brain, uh, this, this big, big spot could be efficient enough to get the, this amount of information, which will be, uh, which will be good for us. Uh, uh, of course, people are working on this project, on the tailoring of the PSF, uh, so the excitation spot, on the increasing the size of the uh, of the uh, of the area which we can image, so the so the field of view. There are just the two great examples from the two two great labs from Ali Pasha Vaziri and Spencer Smith. <coughs> so yes, these solutions are great. Uh, the only one difference between the our solution and that one is that uh, there are relatively complicated. They are fragile and they are not so easy adjustable compared to to our one and the cost because. All of the entire hour modifications, uh, uh, which I will show you in the next slides, cost less than 1,000 pounds. Uh, and it's also very easy to uh, apply them in any lab without specific optical knowledge, specific engineering skills. And it's also relatively easy to maintain them and adjust them com compared to the more sophisticated uh, methods non telescending micros microscopy. So this is something what I wanna show you today. As I was mentioning, the standard uh, two photon setups get the laser, focal cell, beam expander, scanning mirror, scan lens, tube lens, and the objective. In our modification, we just operate between the scan lens and the tube lens region, which is easy to be accessed in 99.9% .9 of the two photon microscopes <coughs> in the world. Uh, because on our modification, we just operate on the fundamentals of optics. We, on the standard diffraction limited configuration, uh, the collimated beam is illuminating the back aperture of objective. We, by disturbing the beam by the single or two lenses, we are just changing this collimation into that divergent way according to the, uh, to the our approach, which we call non telecentric one or non telecentric two, depending if we use one or two lenses. And thanks to that, we can get the increasing of the field of view and uh, uh, and the, the shape, shape, the length of the excitation spot. Uh, 
here on the on the figures you can you can see the example from the standard diffraction limited uh, recording. So this is the maximal size, so, so the, the the brain of the of the single zebrafish. And uh, on the right side, you can see that three zebrafish, uh, which are on the same uh, frame, and uh, we can collect the signal simultaneously from them. Uh, and the zoom area compare the quality of the image for for both of uh, uh, this uh, these cases. On the right uh, side, the the, the mouse cortex. Uh, with the three and a half millimeter field of view image by, by, by our method. So what is our method about? I, as I was mentioning, we just make a modification between the scan lens and the tube lens. <coughs> so we remove the original scan lens and for the non-telecentric method number one, we add two lenses and by moving the, the one, one of those lenses, in this case it's called lens two, between the lens one and the tube lens, we get the increasing of the field of view from 1.2 to 1.8. And in the second modification, we just operate on the one lens. And by the same movement, we can increase the field of view from two and a half up to a three and a half millimeter. Uh, all of the details uh, are precisely described in the manual, which uh, is available on our GitHub. Uh, we are doing our modification on the Saturn microscope, which is relatively popular. And, but it's of course, very easy to apply it to the any other microscopes. I don't know exactly what will be the results because the results will depend on the uh, focal length of the scan lens, tube lens, and the optical configuration, the distance between the tube lens objective, uh, back aperture of the objective, which you are using. But also, if you will look at the, at the manual, you will find an answer how to fastly look on this and how to apply it on your own, uh, own setup. So the first the big, first big advantage of, of our method is just increasing of the, of the field of view. So as I was showing you, just from applying our methods on the standard 20x, 20x size uh, object, objective, we can increase our field of view from the non-telecentric configuration one from 1.2 to 1.8 uh, <coughs> millimeters. <coughs> and from the uh, non-telecentric configuration number two, from two and a half to three and a half uh, uh, millimeter. Uh, the second parameter which is getting changed is the size of the excitation spot, so the so the PSF. So here you can see the example. How does it change across the uh, um, across the the, the, the um, our modifications? And on the video you can see the real time changes. This is the the video which is showing how I change it uh, by by just switching off the microscope. Uh, for a second, switching off the, uh, the shutter on the laser and moving the lens to change the, the configuration. Of course, we can obtain all of the configuration between uh, those two, uh, two edges, which I'm, which I'm presenting here. But as you see uh, by this recording from the, from the side of this excitation uh, uh, spot, <coughs> it's very fast, very efficient, and very easy to, to change it and to adjust it for your experimental uh, needs. Uh, what we also apply the, into our setup is electrical tunnel lens. In this case, we use the Optogen uh, lens with our own custom design, design driver. And by using those non-telecentric optics, uh, we to obtain the jumps up to the 600 microns. So this is the range when the, still the PSF is roughly in the same size. It's just the 10% of the, of the difference. And the field of view is also very, very, very similar to the one in the original way. Uh, we can get ultra fast jump because we are operate only on the small amount of the uh, of the of the value of the of the current on the uh, on the ETL. So up to that three milliseconds, we can. So it's like a one half uh, scanning line uh, configuration. We can get the uh, relatively fast jump in the range between zero and six hundred microns just by changing the angle of the of the divergence of the uh, of the beam. Uh, so we can go to the to the examples. So first one, efficient tailoring of the <coughs> of the Poisson function, so of the excitation spot. Here we got the zebrafish and uh, some sort of the area in the upper uh, spinal cord, and the recording uh, using a different configuration. First is a standard diffraction limited and uh, uh, edges configuration from the non telecentric one and non telecentric. Uh, two. As you see, if we increase the field of view and, of course, afterward zoom into this specific area, we can just simply see more and more on the on the sample. But 
uh, as I was mentioning, we are simultaneously stimulating uh, more on the on the z direction. So just to compare the responses on the on the light stimulus on this uh, uh, on this fish, uh, we can see which configuration is the is the most efficient. Even if the cell in the zebrafish are relatively small and and and, and dense. Uh, as you see, the configuration roughly around the two and a half microns is uh, is showing us the best results that we can get the signal from <coughs> from the more places, both in the in the cell body and the, on the synapses connection uh, on it, compared to, for example, the standard diffraction emitted configuration and. Uh, the, the, the edge configuration with the biggest field of view and with the biggest PSF is a little bit overkilling it. So in these cases, we, we cannot distinguish the, the, the signal between those area. Uh, similar example on the, <clears throat> on the hippocampal slices. Uh, so if in these cases, when the cell on the edge of it are extremely dense located, uh, if we are increasing the the, mm, the length of the of the PSF, we start to 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 get the over overcross of the signal. So it's always good to to try to adjust your experiments for these specific needs. And this is what the, our method is helping to obtain because it's fast and it's efficient, and it's very easy to 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 implement. It's just the exchanging of the single lens and just pushing them across the the, uh, the optical path and 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 this is it so it's very easy to 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 go with the with the different size of the of the psf and also different size of the of the field of view uh next example so the mesoscape imaging of the two zebrafish simultaneously <coughs> uh, so we use this example mainly because the that during the lockdown we get the problem to, 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 to do experiments on the uh, on the on the other species and on the big samples. Uh, so there is no other biological issue, but it can also show that uh, how good is our setup to record the signal for for the in the mesoscale uh, uh, imaging. So we can simultaneously get the signal from the from the two zebrafish, which you can see on the video and also on the. Uh, <clears throat> On the on the track uh, from the from the fluorescent signal traces from the from the different areas, we can simultaneously get the signal from more than and one animal in this uh, uh, in this example. And uh, this is the imaging of the uh, of the one of the fish from the from the previous slide. Uh, so yes, if we are in the mesoscale imaging, and if we are trying to to look at the uh, at the entire fish, uh, we cannot see some of the uh, some of the details mainly because of the size of the pixel so just the resolution if you want to go fast we are losing the resolution if we want to go for more into the details we should focus we should select the region of interest so what we are doing here or we can do slower but in these cases we will, we will not able to record the activity but as you can see still our three and a half big field of view uh, <clears throat> configuration allow us to see the single single cells uh, on the zebrafish, uh, both the spinal cord and the, and the body. Next example of the mesoscale imaging with the random axis. So uh, there are the hippocampal uh, slices uh, when, where we can simultaneously see the activity on the, uh, on the hippocampus and on the cortex. Uh, to, again, to go to the specific region of interest uh, and to go for more details, we just select uh, the two areas and we fastly go from one to the other. So on the one frame, as you can see here on the, on, on the video, uh, we can record the signal from the, those two distinct, uh, distinct areas. Uh, last example of the mesoscale <coughs> imaging. Uh, in, in this case, this is the in vivo recording on the mouse uh, mouse power cortex. Uh, so we begin from the field of view of three and a half millimeter, which was uh, a little bit uh, too big for that example because it's bigger than the size of the of the cranial window. So after all, we go for the a little bit smaller field of view, like a one and a half millimeter, and uh, again we get into the two 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 distinct regions when we record on the on the single frames. Uh, uh, by fast jumping from the from the one area to the other. In this case, everything was done on the uh, on the one one depth on the on the one uh, one plane. Uh, but also, what we've been trying to do in this uh, in this mouse uh, barrel cortex is the X Y Z scanning. So just by addressing the the, the continuous change <coughs> on the on the Z direction, we collect the signal on the X Y Z uh, area. 
uh, across the layer one, two, and three, and four uh, in the cortex. Uh, and yes, we record activity uh, in the in the layer four and layer two, three, and so you can see that it's also possible to not only operate on the flat standard uh, surface, but to bend uh, bend the, um, our our frame, our field of view, according to to our experimental needs. Um, if we're talking about bending of uh, of the imaging plane, this is a great example. So what we are doing here, we are trying to do recording from the entire zebrafish. Um, uh, zebrafish brain. And to better track the anatomy of the optic tectum, uh, we decide to bend uh, in the half pipe our, our field of view. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is the, the recording frame by frame. So we're recording one frame and after that just simply jumping to the, to the, to the, to the other frame. And uh, below you can see those frames after reconstruction uh, and the activity in the, in the both, uh, both of them and the traces, how, how does it look like? Mm. Uh, or the best result is to simultaneously recording on the six uh, different uh, different planes. So uh, the, the flat one, which was located uh, on the uh, equivalent of the uh, of the zero microns, and uh, the top one, the top of the of the of the six one was two hundred fifty microns, which is above the size of the uh, of the zebrafish uh, zebrafish brain. Uh, so yes, again we we recorded for uh, for the money planes just to get the much more signal and just to track the, the anatomy of the uh, of the of the of the animal. Of course, we don't need to go only up, uh, and this is an example of uh, of recording on the three frames simultaneously in the way to first going down, bend it down after bend it up, and uh, and go flat. Uh, so yeah, it's again helping us to to, to see well, just using the one recording and and to track the three different uh, uh, area of the uh, zebrafish uh, brain. Uh, this work has been recently published on the on the current biology when we use this uh, this method uh, to uh, image the zebrafish on the three uh, different banded planes uh, during the stimulated. Uh, it by the different different colors. For more of the details, please go uh, into this paper. Uh, but I think that it's uh, uh, it's a quite nice present how how efficient is the bending of the planes if you want to go and look into the zebrafish brain and, and for example in this case it's zebrafish tectum. Uh, Random multivoy access. So again, zebrafish. And in this experiment, we want to simultaneously look into the eye and to, into the uh, tectum. Uh, so two different regions of interest uh, located on two different depths. Uh, so we get the jump on the on the Z, and we also get the jump on the on the power of the excitation for those two different regions of interest. Uh, because if you are going into the eye, you typically need to use a much higher power to see something on it. So on the top, you can see an example of the HUC, so the pan-neuronal expression line, and the simultaneous response for the same stimulus in the eye and into the brain, uh, here with the ultimate uh, better quality of, uh, of, the, of the structure. And on the top right part, uh, this is a, a similar example of recording, but in this time with uh, sparse labeling, uh, uh, of the of the cell, so we are tracking the same uh, uh, ganglion cell in eye and uh, in the uh, in the tectum, and we are both able to record the activities uh, in those two distinct distinct ranges. So the responses on the same uh, on the same stimulus. Uh, another species, another example. In this case, is the Drosophila in the cooperation with Lucia Pretogodina from the Crick Institute from uh, from London. So uh, in this case, we use the 1.2 configuration with the volumetric imaging, which can fully cover the, uh, the depth, uh, uh, volumetric depth, so the size of the, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the brain. So we combine it with the optogenetic stimulations, and we can fully track the, the activity in the brain on the one uh, single, uh, single experiment. Uh, and here are the, the the traces. So again, even if the species is extremely small, we are still able to to, to see the activity uh, in the in the brain. Uh, the other example is the 
controlling of the shape of um, uh, of our scans. So this is something is also something what we are doing uh, on in in our lab. So on the left side you can see the X Y Z scans uh, in the in the eye and the activity uh, of the uh, of the cones during this this recording, which absolutely help us to to track the activity on the uh, on the brain. On the right side, banana scans. So in this example, this is a tracking of the of the cells in the in the tectum. So we absolutely don't want to waste our uh, time of scanning to to go on on the area when there is no brain or the, the area which is not interesting for for us. We just want to follow this specific area, which in the nature is uh, uh, is in a some sort of rounded shape, but on our frame is uh, is flat, so it's easy to reconstruct it afterward. But on the recording, we can still see the uh, uh, see the activity of, uh, of of the cells, and this example has been also recently uh, recently published. Uh, so if you want to go for more details, uh, please go to to the, our last year current biology uh, paper. Uh, yes, to summarize it. Uh, for all of the uh, details, please check our our preprints. Please check our our GitHub. And if you get any questions, I'm please I'm I'm, I'm totally happy that to 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 ask me ask me about uh, what we are trying to present is the method is the method which will work in any 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 scope. So don't look at the numbers. Maybe on, on your microscope the field of view will be even bigger than three and a half uh, micron. Maybe your PSF will be smaller. Everything depends on the on the configuration. But this method is very easy to to uh, to apply to apply for for any of the of the two photon uh, microscope and I would like to, to thanks all of the people who've been involved in this uh, in this project from from our lab and from the from the other 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 places thank you well thank you Philip uh, before we move on uh, yeah I'd like to say to audience that if you want to join us live right now and ask your question yourself or maybe interact with our guest today so maybe have little details about how to implement such system. Because like you said, Philip, is very interesting. Here we're on um, open neuroscience hardware. So we'd like to share everything. You can find all the plan, not only on Philip and Button Lab GitHub, but also on open neuroscience resources on a open neuroscience repository. So you will find all the documentation, the software, and also the way to easily contact people that contribute to this project. So please do so, don't hesitate. Uh, I do have one question. Ah, sorry, I have multiple. Ah, I lost it. So I have one question from Philip Bartel. How does a sim How does a simultaneous eye and brain beat work programmatically? Programmatically. Um, I'm not sure if I uh, understand uh, this uh, uh, this question. Uh, chat if you want to read it yourself. Mm. How does a simultaneous eye and brain beat work programmatically? So uh, how how does it work? Uh, you know, you just need to select the two 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 different memories. In this case, it's on two different depth, uh, and just track those uh, those, those signal. It's uh, I think it's a uh, it's a nice way to 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 see how the how the outputs from the from the from the eye and from everything what's going on in the retina is just projected into the uh, into the tectum. So hopefully we will still do this uh, this experiments in, in our lab to to investigate more the, uh, of what's going on in this case. I hope that answers your question. Don't hesitate to join us if you want to continue this discussion. Um, we have one from Miguel Fernandez who asks, uh, can you elaborate about photo damage problems with the system you described? Uh, you know the photo damage in the two photon. Uh, it's uh, it's a it's a big topic of the of the discussion, uh, and it's not typically related with with our configuration. It's related with all of the configuration. So if you simply use a, a too much power on, on on your sample, you will you will occur some sort of the uh, photo damage. Uh, but in general, using a non telecentric configuration, you you get the much higher power on the on the on the sample because uh, we are underfilling the back aperture of objective. Uh, but uh, for all of our examples, as uh, as I show, just using a standard uh, um, coherent uh, vision S laser, which is dividing for two setups, uh, we are able to 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 get the signal from for all of the experiments and not reach the photo damage uh, photo damage level. 
so yeah, it's it is a problem, but it's not a problem related with uh, with our specific our setup, our specific our setup. But it's mainly mainly the problem of the of the two photon, and it's also the problem of the of the expression of uh, of the option which you are using. So if the expression is weak, if you are trying to increase your power, you will just simply burn your burn your sample. And uh, if the expression is uh, is relatively relatively high, uh, you just simply need to use a uh, lower power. So so this is it. Uh, I will follow up with something. Um, in your paper, in your introduction, you say that it is easy to install. So we saw that it's uh, accessible for anyone without a proper engineering background to actually install the system. But you also say that it's low cost. Do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, yes, you typically what you need to use are the two words freelancers uh, depend uh, on, on what you are doing just to implement the non telecentric configuration and to implement the uh, uh, the ETL setup in our configuration. The most expensive part is the ETL by itself. Uh, all the rest is the Arduino and the, and the software. The, the original software which we wrote is uh, in, the, in the MATLAB, but it's also very easy to address it on the, any other uh, language uh, to, to, because it's absolutely independent from this from the scanning, uh, mm, scanning software which we are using. Uh, so roughly all of the costs should be should be below the. Uh, mm, Below the thousand of uh, thousand of pounds. All right. Well, good to know. Uh, do we have more questions from the audience before we shut on this stream? I give you one minute. All right. I see that Philip is with us. Do you want to ask a question? Philip, if you can unmute yourself. Hello. 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 Hi, guys. Um, yeah, um, first of all, nice to see you. Uh, um, now, so I, I, that's the thing, because I remember that the project with the um, ganglion cell, right? So that has been, uh, at least the idea has been around for a while, right? But how does it work software-wise? I mean, is it the case that now the software with two different regions just works or...? Yeah, yeah. The, you know, the, the biggest advantage of this project uh, is to get the, the proper fish line with the sparse level expression of, uh, of the single cells. Uh, because, uh, yeah, the, the two different worry, I was doing this uh, three, four weeks ago, on the yeah. example, and it still works. Addressing in on the ETL is also relatively, relatively easy and, and fast. So uh, it's, uh, it's not the issue of the, of the software why you are not continuing this project. It's just the... Uh, so wait a second, like, like, does it mean that now, for example, right, uh, if I want to, let's say, look how signal propagates from one area to the other at some fairly high temporal frequency, I could just do it, right? Like, I don't, I, I don't need a super setup for that, right? I just need yours. Yeah, the, the, you know, mm -hmm. the main limitation is expression. If you want to lose on the, uh, look at the sparse labeling, it's very difficult you know, to find this in synaptic. Uh, on, so just to find the plane. Or for, or for mm -hmm. an and the other problem is just the movement of the animal. You know, if you want to go for the, for the serious the synaptic signal, uh, you need to be very strictly uh, with, uh, with it and just simply do not, do not lose it during the, during the stimulation. And still get the signal, which as you know, it's not, not easy. Uh, to 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 get to the to the ganglion cells. So this is the main limitation that this project is is challenging because because of that. Yeah, no, it's just uh, it, it's still quite cool because you you can still achieve quite good temporal resolution even though you're switching between different regions, which is real nice. Yeah, that it it will just depend how big the region is, uh, and, and this is the main main issue for that. Yeah, actually, so this is something that I don't think I've ever done. Right, or at least I, I never thought about this properly, right? But effectively, your sampling, right, looks sort of very weird, right? Because you have, uh, like, for a given point, right, at that moment when you're switching, right, you have like uneven sampling. So, like, have you looked at all at uh, how you should be interpolated? Uh, no, no, no. I haven't looked at it, but I've got it in the plan, especially that uh, hopefully soon we will start to use the resonance scanner, which uh, will help us to, uh, to, to, to go faster and to work a little bit on the sampling. Because up to now, it was not neat, as you, as you know, because you know, our, our imaging was good enough to still get the anatomy of the animals and, uh, and the temporal resolution of, of our responses. 
Okay, guys, I will uh, offer you to continue this discussion just after we are still live. Um, I have uh, not a question, but a suggestion. Uh, can you elaborate a little more about the ETL? Um, how can it be complemented with a non telecentric system? Uh, because, you know, in a non telecentric system, by focusing uh, of our beam, we are moving our excitation spot uh, yeah. forward from, uh, from the beam. So by the ETL and introducing it uh, far away from the point when we focus it on the, on the back aperture, by tiny changes of the angle of the beam, which is going through the scanning mirrors, uh, our replaces of the, of the tube lens and the entire system, uh, we can easily refocus it back in the, in the up way. Uh, uh, of, uh, of our optical system. So in our configuration, the ETL works uh, efficiently only in the way of going, going back up, mm -hmm. uh, which is very efficient because I, as I was mentioning, the differences in the PSF and the field of view, it's uh, only up to the 10% uh, in the range between the zero and 600 microns uh, uh, up. So how do you match the PSF size to the sample then? How do I match with the uh, with the sample? Uh, you know, it's just trying and, and looking on the on the sample. This is the I think the best idea. So we are just simply recording from the from the specific area, uh, fastly, and after that increasing PSF and checking if it's better or not. This is how how it works. Okay, uh, so depending on the animal, you go. Exactly, depending on the on, on the on, on the expression level, because it will be different from the sample to sample, from the from this, you know, even across the same species, you will see that uh, the different structure, even in the zebrafish, if everyone is thinking that the exactly. zebrafish are similar, they are absolutely different. So, true. Uh, so let me check if we have questions on Slack. Uh, no, we do not. Um, thanks for that. Uh, thanks a lot. If people want to join us to continue this discussion here on Zoom, uh, I guess. Uh, Philip, Philip Bartel has more questions, so we can continue on. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we will have another talk next Friday, so please stay in tune. Uh, you will receive all the information. Once again, come, uh, come visit the website, openneuroscience.com. You can also find us on Twitter. Do visit, check. You will find some all the documentation that you need for whatever project you may consider contributing or implementing your own system. Thank you, and see you next week.